Have you noticed any admissions trends or surprises this cycle? It's been very slow. Um, so I'm seeing a lot more wait lists. And I think that we're gonna see a ton of wait list movement this summer. Hello and welcome to episode 448 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. I'm Ben Olson and with me is Nathan Fox. We're the co-founders of LSATdemon.com and the LSAT Demon Daily Podcast. With us today, we have Micah McCreary. You're a, a guest and a former student and podcast listener. We'll get into that soon. Um, if you want to be LSAT famous, you can share news and ask questions on our website, thinkinglsat.com. Nathan, you have a free class coming up on April 18th at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. That's just your regular class, right? It's my regular class. You'll get to see the same class that I teach to paying live subscribers totally for free. LSATdemon.com forward slash free. Hope to see you all there. Great. So, yeah, why don't you introduce Micah, Nathan? Yeah, um, I'll read the bio that uh, producer Eric wrote for you here, Micah. And I know we've emailed in the past, but we've never met in person. So yeah, nice to meet you in person. Micah McCreary is a Harvard Law student and the founder of Juris Prep, where he offers LSAT coaching and law school admissions consulting. He shares our goal of helping students attend law school for free. Micah studied with LSAT Demon and is a longtime listener of the Thinking LSAT podcast. We tore apart his personal statement, which included four semicolons. In Thinking LSAT episode 196. Um, how you doing, Micah? I'm doing good, thanks. How are you? Great, great. You got a little peek behind the podcast curtain this morning uh, as a longtime podcast listener. You got to see the uh, the travails of being a regular podcaster. <laughs> ben, how, I how did. Many, it, was, it was nice. <laughs> how, how many um, of our episodes would you say have had technical glitches or... or personal delays from me or you what's our success rate of just like on time departure if we were an airline what's our on time departure Ooh, it's for this really podcast? bad yeah no one would <laughs> yeah. like to fly with us <laughs> it's like 40 percent. so yeah. this morning ben was had his car in for like a minor repair and it was supposed to be well scheduled uh, well done in advance but he's texting me 10 minutes before we are scheduled to record with a guest micah uh so sorry about the delay micah but um his car is like still just hoisted up on the rack and he can't even get to the podcast. Just one of many. What is that like the about the 50th, maybe biggest impediment that we've had uh, over the years of creating this show? Yeah. Yeah. The, it's a the, lot of work. <laughs> the worst one was always the one where we had to re-record the same whole podcast three times. That was yeah. that was just miserable. That I'm, one was I'll a bad one. That, that was one. number yeah. one. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Doing it roughly once a week for, yeah, I mean, it won't be too long until we're coming up on 10 years, Ben, of uh, doing this show. So, yeah. Oh, you know what? Good opportunity for me to ask. If you're a listener and you haven't subscribed to our show, I, I just want to ask you, a really, do me a favor. Just hit the subscribe button, please. It helps us a lot with all the stupid algorithms. So if you're out there listening to this show for free for one episode, 10 episodes, 447 episodes. I'm asking you now from my heart, a personal favor, please just subscribe to the show. Thank you uh, very much for doing that. All right, Micah, Harvard Law School, 1L, 2L, 3L? 2L. Through a, through a long and winding path, I'm a 2L now. What's the long and winding path? Yeah, so um, I actually applied back in, oh, I guess I applied in 2019. Um, during the cycle right leading up into the pandemic year. Um, got admitted in uh, March of 2020. Um, in March of 2020, the world ended. Um, and so I ended up going to Zoom School of Law for my first year of law school um, at Harvard. So I moved to Cambridge, lived like right across the street from the law school, um, never went inside. Everything was remote. And so after that year, um, just decided to take some personal time and make sure that everything sort of went back to in person and and uh, took two years off, and now I'm finally back here for uh, for my second year of law As school. As a two L, interesting. Was, so wait, was your yeah. first semester in person though? No. So I started in the in the fall of 2020. So spring of 2020 is when I got in. When oh fall COVID of 2020, started. the world had already stopped. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay. So you just yeah, yeah. started first day of one L online. All right. Completely online. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
how did Harvard do adapting to that? Yeah. Uh, I think that they would say that they did better than I would say that they did. Um, there was a lot of, so they, we, we were all supposed to still move to Cambridge anyway. Um, just given the possibility that everything might come back to normal at the very least, we were supposed to be ready to move to Cambridge at the drop of a hat. So we moved to Cambridge and then we sat in Cambridge paying Cambridge rent and living there for a year. Where were you moving from? Phoenix. I'm from Phoenix, Arizona. Got it. So with this, with the start date of the semester, just getting pushed back and pushed back and pushed back and pushed back or not the semester, but like in-person stuff. And, and then eventually in January or February, we all got an email saying like, we think that we're doing a good enough job with Zoom School of Law and, and we're just going to do the rest of the year online. Um, and I think, I mean, it was, it was comparable with the exception of the, you know, the in-person element, which I do think is really important and is why I ultimately decided to to push back a year and then one more year after that to make sure everything's back to normal. That's brutal, man. Yeah, that is brutal. How hard was it to push back? I'm curious. To defer or well, yeah. not defer, take a leave of absence. Um, I, I can't speak to other law schools, but at HLS, it was pretty easy. Um, they were really accommodating, especially given that year and everything like that. Um, I think that my my speculation is that it's because people come back to Harvard. Like it's just somewhere you don't really take a year off and then give, give up and stop. Like they know you're going to come back. And so they're pretty accommodating. So I can't speak to what other law schools would do, but um, Harvard was great. Um, they were super helpful and, and really helped me out. Did they use Zoom for their classes? Yes. Yeah. Everything was on Zoom. All of them were on Zoom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good decision there. <laughs> good decision to not use Microsoft Teams or whatever else. Did some law schools do that? I've just been, I, I, I'm just, maybe I'm biased because we've always used Zoom, but I mean, like it was for us, it was March of 2020 and we moved <laughs> Ben's class and my class online onto Zoom in like what, Ben, a week or two weeks yeah. or something like yeah. that. I mean, it was just mm -hmm. like, boom. And we were teaching our classes on Zoom and they were instantly bigger. And I actually think better than our in-person classes ever were. And that was like immediately right off the bat. Would you agree, Ben? Yeah, for sure. I, absolutely. I mean, I work with clients on Zoom too. I, I don't see any difference when it comes to this kind of thing. Um, it works really well. But law school, you think is different? Well, I mean, law school, half of the half of the law school experience is about who you meet and who you talk to and who you get to know, you know, like, like, yes, like all your classes are important and things like that. But you, you all have spoken on the podcast before I've heard it <laughs> about how every student takes the same classes, you know, you all take torts, contracts, Civ Pro, et cetera. And at the end of the day, only your 1L year is really that applicable to the bar. Maybe corporations is, you know, maybe evidence is, but other than that, like the bar exam is, is something you're going to study for after you've already finished law school for the most part, or as you're finishing law school. Um, and so a lot of where I think the benefit to being in person comes from is really making relationships with people that are in your classes and, and, and who have similar affinities because you're building a network, you're building a legal network for after you graduate and the legal field is small. Like at the end of the day, the legal field is really small. And so who you meet really ends up being useful to you. I mean, it's already been, um, having been here, for the you know year and a half and change that I've been here so far. So they happily let you uh, push back for two years and now you're starting your 2L year or no, you're finishing your 2L year? Wrapping up 2L, yep. Yeah, yep. okay. Got half a semester left. What's your focus? What do you do in the summer? So this summer I'm going to a big law firm. I'm gonna be doing a white collar defense. Um, it's an international firm, which was my goal going into law school. Um, so I'm gonna be doing a fairly heavy international aspect to that with white collar defense and then hopefully some international arbitration. Um, we'll see if that's what I do after I graduate. It looks like it probably will be. Um, uh, but yeah, big law for the time being. And then in the long run, I'm hoping to make a pivot into um, like criminal defense or criminal prosecution, TBD. I know I want to do trial work. That's what I know I want to do. But That does seem fun. If I had to be a lawyer, I think I would want to be a trial lawyer. Do you agree, Ben? Uh, I don't know. Trying to convince <laughs> jury members. That might be tough. I think yeah. more like appellate law would be interesting. Trying to convince uh, judges. For me, put me in a, put me in a courtroom with a bunch of jurors. I want to be Saul Goodman. I mean, if I, if I had to do some, if I had to, right, which would be like the worst day of my life if I had to be a lawyer, but if I had to be a lawyer, yeah, make me the public defender. I think like something where I don't have to maybe do so much preparation. 
I just get to go in and like make my pitches in the in the courtroom, like just trial after trial after trial after trial after trial. I think that would be good because I'm like fast on my feet, and that that I think would be, I don't know. I think that would be the only way that I could survive. Like if I had to sit there solitary doing paperwork, <laughs> forget it. I'm like I'm not making it. A little worried about that. Yep, I hear you. Say more about that. Paperwork. Yeah, you being worried about that. Well, I mean. I don't know. I think I think the biggest concern going into big law actually doesn't even have to do with busy work and things like that. It has more to do with work life balance. That's something I really care about. Um, and that I, I mean, even even working, you know, running my own business and, and having clients that I have to accommodate and things like that. It's pretty, pretty regimented with my time. I don't like working after five. You know, I don't like working weekends if I can help it, things like that. And I know big law has a pretty nasty reputation for like 80 hour work weeks and things like that. So that was one of the biggest things that I was most, most interested to ensure, I guess, to the best of my ability. It's such a black box, the big law hiring process. Um, it, it shouldn't be, but it is. And and finding out what law firms are like more work-life balance focused is, is sometimes difficult. And so, so what I did is just sort of went for a market. I'm going to be in Boston. Um, after law school. Um, so I went for a market that's known for more work-life balance and then found a firm that's known even more for that and sort of hoping that those two things will balance out and talk to me in, in a few months and I'll let you know after the summer what I think, but um, but I'm hoping that I'll manage to pull that off. As far as the busy work is concerned, I think I think that it's pretty common for first and second year associates to get very little impactful really substantive work, mostly because you're not, I mean, when you're in law school, you're not learning how to be a lawyer. Like you're not at all. Uh, you learn how to be a lawyer. It, in fact, in, in one of my years off, um, I worked at a law firm in Phoenix doing property law. Property law was my favorite class in law school or in, in, in one L at least not in law school in one L was my favorite class. And I got to this law firm and was practicing property law as a law clerk and doing like tons of stuff. Arizona's got cool, things where students who have done a year of law school can practice. And this firm was really understaffed. So I was representing people in, um, I'm sorry, I was representing corporations in zoning hearings. And I learned more in one week of doing practical work as a property law, you know, as a property law attorney um, than I did in that entire class. It was my favorite class. Like I loved it. And that's, I mean, that's your first couple of years of practice is figuring out what you want to do and how you're going to do it. And then after that, they start giving you more meaningful things to do. Um, that's my understanding. Again, talk to me in yeah. six months and I'll let you know if, that, if that's the reality. But They have to wait for half of you to wash out before they make too much of an investment in you. You know, like they're going to pay you $180,000 a year, but that's nothing to them. And the thing is that they're going to pay two of you $180,000 a year for two years. And then there's only going to be one of you left. And then that one, they're going to make more of an investment in. It's like that, uh, was it in the unhappy, unhealthy thing that we talked about, that Vanderbilt Law Review, Ben, um, that it, it said in there that they, they're going to demand work of you, the way I understand it, Micah, and I've never done it, but what we read was, they're going to demand work of you that's perfect yesterday and done without any help at all. And as long as you can do that for two years, solid then you know you'll you'll sort of make the cut to the next phase where they'll start bringing you in on some stuff. That's that's definitely the stereotype, especially in corporate law. Um, I'm going into litigation, um, which I'm happy about. That's also known for being a little bit more you know substantive um, early see. on. But um, that's definitely the reputation, at least of some firms. Um, I, I don't know necessarily which, or I don't know if it's right to say which have these you know reputations here or there. You can yeah. find that out if you look on Chambers Associate, but. Um, but yeah, it just it just depends, I think. Um, but it's definitely it's definitely uh, the attrition is baked into their business model very much. Attrition is is fully expected, and they pay you really yeah. well, knowing that the one that pays off, the two, three that pay off and make equity partner, are going to make them huge amounts of money down the road, and it'll it'll compensate for the attrition. Yeah, they're actually underpaying you when you graduate. I mean, making one hundred eighty thousand dollars a year after the ringer that you had to go through to get there, or the amount of talent that you have to have in order to get there, right? You've got to have elite GPA, elite LSAT. That's a serious chunk of your life to make those things happen. You have to then kick ass at law school. Then you have to make it through their interview process or summer job and make sure that you're really making the cut. They should be paying you. I mean, your value to them is a lot more than that. 
astronomically higher. And if you do the math too, I did the, <laughs> I shouldn't have done this, but I did this the other day uh, a few weeks ago. If you divide, you know, like right now, market rate for big law is at two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars a year. If you divide that by, say, that stereotypical eighty-hour work week, you're making like not what you should be making. You know, like it's way lower than you expect it to be when you take your time into consideration on an hour, hourly basis. You know, it's like, yeah, that's a huge number relative to other starting professionals. But what's the trade-off? Like how much of your life and happiness and, you know, like, I don't know, like how many gray hairs are you, are you taking on in exchange for this amount of money that, yeah, like scales up predictably this amount every year, you know, maybe you can make millions in your life as a partner, but like most people don't. And I think that that's really relevant. Yeah. It's a bit of a, a bit of like a lottery ticket that you're buying when you, when you take that big lot associate, because you just know going in that half of you aren't going to make it like half of you are going to be, or not even half, right? What is it? That, how many are going to actually make equity partner and be millionaires? One not even, of, not close to half. Five, one out of 10, you know, not even that. So they've got the carrot out there, but the carrot's way out there. And it's really unlikely that you're actually going to be able to grab it. To be fair, I will say it is very frequently used as a springboard to other options. Um, like the firm that I'm going to, one of their biggest selling points to me once they had given me the offer was like, look, we've got a ton of associates who go on to become assistant U.S. attorneys in really covetable markets. And so people will use it as, and they know that, like they know that they're, they're, they're they almost have an, they call it an alumni group. And their alumni are off doing these great things. And that's really substantial and relevant and, and, and great. And so, so for the people that are using big laws as springboard to other things, like that's useful I think to that their that's clients the, who are then yeah. going to later be prosecuted oh, absolutely. by those same people. And, yeah. and it's a revolving door, you know, like you go become a federal prosecutor and then you get bored being a federal prosecutor and you're like, Hey, like big law firm, can I come back? Right. And they're like, sure. Yeah, absolutely. You're a federal prosecutor for 20 years. We'd love to have you. It's going to be super useful to us. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely it's, it's, there's a lot of nuance to it. Um, but a lot of the stereotypes, at least the word of mouth around here, um, is that the, the stereotypes do bear out at least at a lot of firms. So talk to us about, uh, Juris Prep. Yeah. So, um, Juris Prep sort of started out as just, uh, it was honestly, it started out as a bit of an accident. I started, so in my, in my years off, um, from law school, I was back in Phoenix, I was working at this law firm and honestly, like getting paid not enough for the amount of work that they were having me do and decided I would, um, you know, move on to enjoy the time that I had off rather than working myself super hard. And so I, I, um, got put in contact with a friend of a friend, um, who was looking for some LSAT help. You know, I had this you know, very good LSAT score. I go to Harvard law school. Someone was like, Hey, like this guy can help you out. So started helping her out, helped out a few other people. And eventually they all did fairly well. I helped them get into law school as well with scholarships and, 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 um, and really great outcomes. Um, the first one I worked with was like a low stat applicant got into Georgetown, super big surprise, like, and ended up going there. And now she's there and killing it at Georgetown. And, so from that and some word of mouth, all of a sudden clients sort of started pouring in and I had referral programs and ended up working with Arizona State University, which is my alma mater, um, with a partnership with like a class and things like that. And all of a sudden the company got a lot bigger. Um, and we we really focus on two things and, and those things are very much tied together. Um, one of them is LSAT coaching because like you two have spoken about probably ad nauseum, you know, like your LSAT score is the most important thing to your success in your law school applications. Like hands down, there is nothing that is more important than your LSAT score. And so getting your LSAT score as high as humanly possible is, it is the most important thing. And so that's the first thing that we focus on with our clients. And, and that's in a, in a one-on-one -on -one coaching model. And so, so we, we realize that it's not necessarily for everybody, but for the people who do look for that sort of thing, um, we, we help them get really great LSAT scores. Um, the clients that work with me, at least, um, average, as of right now, 22 points of improvement. Um, full disclosure, that I mean, that bakes in the understanding that accommodations are something that help a lot of students and things like that, too. So um, those scores, you know, run the gamut from 
you know, accommodated and unaccommodated students, but 22 points of improvement is a, is a really massive jump. And so then um, from there, we'll work with students who want to um, on applications and admissions consulting. Um, and that's actually the the part that, that I've been the most proud of lately. Um, all of our admissions consulting clients work with me. And to date, all of them have gotten full ride offers to top 100 law schools. Um, and so our biggest goal, kind of in line with what you guys do, so with a little bit of nuanced difference is to give people the option. So rather than saying like, go for free period, I realize that there are students who are going to hear that and not do it. You know, they're going to say, I want to go to this T14 or something like that. My biggest goal is to make sure that those students who are, you know, T14 or bust or what have you also have a full ride on the table or four or six so that they can make an educated decision rather than having to decide between say like Michigan and Berkeley and that's it. And then maybe they're on the wait list at some other T14 doesn't really matter which, and there's a sticker price and they got to pay this, you know, $300,000 over the course of three years with living expenses to go to law school and go into crazy amounts of debt. They don't have to make the decision between where they're going to go into that much debt necessarily. They get to make the decision between, do I want this debt or do I want a free legal education at some other amazing school. And I mean, most of my clients are getting full ride scholarships at not just like T100s, but like T30, T, you know, like T50 schools. And so we're really trying to give them as many options as possible. Yeah, I don't think that's actually a difference. I mean, we say don't pay, uh, we say don't pay for law school as a tagline at the end of every show, but we don't mean that literally like do not pay we understand that if everybody paid zero there would no longer be any law <laughs> that's true um and we also understand and many of our teachers have departed to go to harvard stanford yale other top 14 schools and they've decided that it's worth it for them to pay something including all the way up to full freight at a, at harvard law school and or yale or whatever um, so we understand that reality as well. It's just, uh, you know, that doesn't fit neatly into a tagline at the end of the show. I realize that. I realize that. I was more speaking about the tagline. I'm not talking about your actual philosophy. Yeah, yeah. But I think we're exactly 100% aligned because that's what we would, that's what we always say too. It's like, well, okay, if you think you're T14 or bust, yeah, but why don't you just throw in the application to Wash U in St. Louis and see what that full ride potentially plus stipend looks like. And then you can really compare and figure out what you're actually paying for here. Also, there are going to be intermediate offers, right? It's never like Wash U for $0 and Yale for $70,000. If you applied correctly, you're going to have offers in between there with Michigan and Duke and whoever else trying to creep in with a, a, a smaller offer. Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, what's the opportunity cost? Like if you don't have a fee waiver, you're paying an extra, say $85 for the application fee and $45 for the LSAC fee. If that results in $300,000 of savings or, well, I guess 215 for the tuition or whatever it comes out to, how is that not, in what world is that, you know, hundred and Forty dollars to to an, an extra school. You're already paying yeah. like a huge amount to apply to other schools. Like just do it. Like, like it'll it'll give you more options at the very least. Yeah, yeah, totally. What's your uh, what's your plan after? I mean, so you're gonna you're going into big law. What's your plan for Juris Prep when you uh, start working full time? Well, um, that's so that I mean, the big law is TBD. It's going to depend on whether I want to keep working for myself or whether I want to work for a, a law firm. Um, but as it stands right now, um, I mean, Juris Prep isn't going anywhere. I have people working with me and, and, and other people that, that can take on more work if I need to take on less and things like that. Um, but as it stands right now, like there's no reason, I mean, I've been able to make this work so far with, with a law school commitment pretty, pretty comfortably actually. Um, and so I'm going to try to keep this going as long as I can. And then if, um, if my you know, career takes me in a different direction in a few years. So be it. But yeah. Where did you start with the LSAT? Like what's, what was your cold diagnostic? What was that experience for you? 158, I think. Um, 158, 159, somewhere in there. Um, so pretty, it was a pretty good cold diagnostic, but um, yeah, my, my experience was longer. My, my LSAT prep process was longer than it should have been. Um, mostly because I, 
started working with another test prep company, one of the you know big name ones that really set me back. They had it like a program through my school where they were like, hey, it's free online, you know, at this self-paced program. And then, but oh wait, but you can add, if you want to do it in person, you can do it for like $1,200. And I like, I asked my grandpa for money so that I could take the in-person class and ended up setting me back three, four months. <laughs> I feel really bad because he, he financed my, my LSAT prep um, for something that just didn't pay off. And then, so after that, I was really frustrated because my, my scores, like, I mean, they went up into like the mid low mid one sixties, but that was mostly because of my own work and not because of the, the prep course. And it was also unintuitive and it was like questions stem first. And then, you know, all this, all this stuff, it was just really, I didn't love it. And so I, I found the LSAT demon actually as a, as an accident, I started listening to another LSAT podcast um, I think it was the power score podcast. And then I was like, there's only 10 episodes of this back then. So I was looking for more. I found thinking LSAT, um, heard about the demon. You guys had just launched it. I think like not too long before it was earlier LSAT demon days. And so I listened for a while and kind of bought in and I got, a. I I think your, I think your biggest plan back then, um, and was just working through that and self-studied with the LSAT demon and, and, and what you guys have in there. Um, and started scoring in the 170s pretty quickly. Um, and then ultimately, I think it was like four months on the Demon. Um, and my my final score was a 174 back in 2019, back when it was a five-section test. And that was still a 99th percentile score, which is which is uh, different these days. But um, though I think it's actually, I think it's still 99th percentile. I'm not really sure. But yeah, it was it was a whole journey. And actually, that's, that's something else too. Like, I mean, when, when I have... Uh, when I have one-on-one clients, um, I always have them use the LSAT demon. Like that's the, that's the thing that I always have them study from. Like, I don't need to provide them with materials if they already exist. I'll just answer their questions. And so it works out really well. And so, yeah, I've never had any reason to use any other, any other resource. So hope you that's okay. Group I mean. classes, you, oh, referring people to use our product. Yeah. We're more than happy to, uh, help your customers. I hope that they're continue to be happy with the product. And we would actually be really interested in your feedback on the demon as it continues to evolve, because we're always rolling out new, new features and fixes and all that. So if you see stuff that you really like, or if there's features that you would want as a tutor, we would be uh, definitely all ears. Ben, anything about that or our dev process? No, I definitely want to know. I mean, we're, <laughs> we have like so many features that we want to roll out, but if we, if we hear people clamoring for one more than another, then, you know, we'll give that priority. Yeah. Happy to, happy to weigh in as things come up. Anything come to your mind? Like as you work with people and have them use the demon, is it like, Oh yeah. If only, yeah. If they could just. Um, well, yeah. So yeah, a couple of things. So now that you mention it, um, one of them, I actually think, so I know you can't do this on the actual test, but I think like I, my, the biggest barrier I have with my clients is getting them to listen to me on the clock, like turn it off, turn it off, period. It's not helping you at all. Make it go away. And like, I think you all have it pretty, pretty customized to make it look as close to, you know, the actual test as possible. And so there's always that little progress bar up there. And I have some really like antsy type A clients where like, I just stare at the progress bar. I'm like, stop, like put a sticky note over it or something like that. Like, even though that's not necessarily real testing conditions, like I'm trying to get them to internalize, like it happens immediately when I'm like, stop trying to complete the damn section, just yeah. do question one, get it right. Then do question two, get it right. Question three. And then yeah. like the moment it, it's crazy. The moment that they finally internalize it. Like I'll get a text from someone like nine, 17 out of 17. Correct. I didn't complete the section, but 17 straight. Correct. And I was like, I know, like I've been telling you this whole time. Like what, what is it that finally made you do it? And I think it's, they're just like, they're so sick of it just not working. And they're like completing 26 questions with 10 wrong. And I'm like, look, you could have done 10 less guessed blindly and gotten as many as what three points. If you're lucky, four points more on this section. And finally, they'll just get so frustrated that they'll try it. And it's like, it would cut down so much of their time. I could be like, you, I'm not going to meet with you if you didn't turn the clock off all the way. So you had no idea, like all the way. So that'd be great. Um, other than that, the only thing, other thing that came to mind, you already implemented, which is the, the, 
games free um scoring but yeah, I think you rolled that out like right after they announced that games are. Going I think to we were first with that. I mean, Ben stayed up all night or whatever, and <laughs> all of a sudden we had the toggle. I mean, the whole team did. Abigail and everybody else just like killed themselves to get this toggle online, and it was like within a week of them making the announcement. I feel like we, you could click the toggle, and you can do the entire demon with just no games whatsoever. Um, yeah, that was, note, that was remarkable. The sticky note tip is legit, and we've actually talked about that. I don't know if we talked about it on the podcast, but I've certainly talked about it in classes before that um, I think I think you can do that in the real testing environment. I mean, you might not like they might not technically allow you, but how could they even possibly know you've got a sticky note on the back of your laptop or whatever? And then during the section, you just reach behind, grab your sticky note and just put it up over the camera. Or not the camera, you put it up over the timer, just that little, the yeah, because so just for people who don't know, in the daemon, we do exactly what they have on the actual um, interface that you use when you take the official LSAT, which is they've got the clock, you can click the clock, the clock disappears, except for it doesn't actually disappear, it changes into like a progress bar, or I think we have been a progress wheel circle yeah yeah it's very whatever. similar yeah it's yeah it's super similar and it's just this graphical representation of how far you are and we have heard students say yeah but that drives me crazy and now i'm constantly looking at it like is that one quarter or is that one third you know <laughs> like trying to do math and figure out how much time they have remaining but like a little tiny just a little tiny sticky note actually is a lo-fi solution to uh that problem what do you think ben we yeah. start talking about that well, in classes yeah, we should. Well, I I have two comments. One, first of all, uh, it was Abigail who stayed up all night, so I don't deserve any credit for that. Okay. I woke up in the morning and it was done. It's like, wow, yeah, thanks, Abigail. Yeah. Um, but the second thing is, he, when you think about all the features that we're trying to roll out, some of them are huge, some of them are small. This would be a very small one, so it's very easy to implement. The question is, can we really hide that without having these like trickle down consequences? Right, like people hiding it and then not getting used to ignoring it. Yeah. I, I don't know. It's tough. They have, to get I, used I, to, they have to get used to ignoring it, right, Micah? So either they get used to ignoring it as it is, or they get used to ignoring it by implementing the little sticky note. We, we should, Ben, we should make some like miniature sticky notes with the demon logo. <laughs> I, I hate I hate how, how uh, non-technical it is, though. I, I just yeah. like... I want something where they could click it. Maybe it goes away and then it's like it comes back the next time and you got to try it this time. But you know you're going to get those people who, who hide it forever. forever and forget about it. And then they're surprised on the day of the test. That's the problem. Yeah. To, to your point, I mean, there is there is merit to that like frustrated realization that this isn't working. Like it, it happens almost without fail. Like the vast majority of of the students that I have uh, they just won't do it at first. They're just like, I've got, like it makes more yeah. sense initially intuitively to finish 26 questions instead of 17, right? Like that's hard to get into someone's head. And there's something to, cause I mean, I did it. I, when I was taking the test, like I was listening to the, the, the thinking LSI podcast. And I was like, no, cause I was missing like six per section, um, which was pretty good for where I was at. You know, I was like, you know, this is better than most people are doing probably, you know, I'm fine. I'll just keep trying to finish the section. Never stop missing six like it was always six and finally one day i was just like fine 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 i'll try it and i did it and all of a sudden like i missed three or something like that and then it's like the other thing that i really like to say and actually i i, I really like saying this um like over and over and over again until it really <laughs> sinks in is that this you can't worry about speed like that's always and, and you guys talk about this but like speed i like to say speed is a byproduct of accuracy it's like that on reading comp it's like that on games they're all the same section by the way like spend your time up front spend your time up front in games do worlds spend your time up front in, in logical reason predict the answer spend your time up front in reading comp understand the damn passage understand it predict the next sentence you know all these things that can like really help you it's like you know what's going on when i ask you a question about it, you're like yeah i know that like that's how you fly through sections It's because you're accurate. It's not because you're like simultaneously learning how to be accurate and fast. It's like you get like, it's like when you're, yeah. I don't know, like when you pick up a new sport, you get good at it and you get faster at it. 
you know, like you get better at it over time as you do it more, like just do it more and do it the right way. That's, yeah. the moral I mean, the story. problem is the Kaplan's and Princeton's of the world that teach really gimmicky strategies that are not focused on actually understanding the test. Our message to our students is constantly, we're going to teach you how to actually understand the test. If you don't want to actually understand the test, or if you want to insist that, no, the test just doesn't make sense and I need some gimmicks here, well, then go buy magic beans from somebody else because that's not what we sell. We sell real understanding. And if we can, and, and, it, and it is, and Ben and I talk about this all the time, and Micah, welcome to LSAT teaching because LSAT teaching for us and for everybody who's ever worked with us, all of our tutors, everybody has this exact same story which is I just have to tell them 15 fucking times and then they finally get it. And Micah, it happened to you personally where you, it's like when you finally did it and it worked and then it's like, oh yeah, that's what Ben and Nathan have been yelling in my actual ear holes for like <laughs> two years of listening to the podcast. And then finally like, oh, maybe I should actually try that. Yeah, listeners out there, if you haven't already done this, you need to stop <laughs> trying to finish the sections. And it is, Approximately half of what we say, Ben, in all of our classes and on this podcast. Half. Yeah. <laughs> it's like all we say. But we can put it this way. Like you have a financial incentive to stop. The sooner you stop doing that, the faster you're going to be done studying for the LSAT, the faster you're going to have to stop paying for coaching, for LSAT, whatever it is. Like just do it. It'll be way easier for you. Yeah. I wonder if it has something to do with loss aversion. Like people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because you're gonna value that loss more than the potential gain. And you feel like you're giving that. up. You feel like you're giving up the questions that you don't attempt, and the the pain of not doing the last seven is worse than the pain of the ten that you miss after attempting them all. Right? Because you like think you did well, and then you get it back, and it's like fifteen out of twenty five. And, and, but you, you didn't, you didn't like voluntarily give anything up. It was the test just saying, now nah, you, you don't get a point for those, but it, it's that you have to get people to voluntarily sacrifice questions at the end of the section. And I think that's, what's so painful for people. I was just going to say, especially as people who are, you know, used to being students and, and getting all the right answers and trying really hard to get all the right answers all the time. Like, like college tests are so different from the LSAT that there's like, there's a, there's a big disparity in, in what you should expect, I think. And maybe the even things. the SAT, right? Like, I think that there's questions deep in the section on the SAT that it's like, oh, you might look at that and glance, glance at it and be able to answer it in eight seconds. You know, it's like, I, I look at the problem. Oh, I know the answer has to be odd. There's only one odd answer choice. Boom. That's the answer. But the LSAT just doesn't work like that. Logical reasoning does not work like that. Games don't work like that. Reading comp doesn't work like that. You have to actually understand every single question or else you're not getting it right. And there's no, there aren't those kinds of gimmicky shortcuts, but people have been trained to do tests in that way. So then they think, well, I just, I have to, that's, Hey, that's multiple choice 101. Or that's standardized testing 101. We have to make sure that we save time to do all the questions. You can't leave questions unanswered at the end, but you know, I'm here, Ben's here, Mike is here. We're all here to tell you that you absolutely should, unless you're already scoring 175, you absolutely should be sacrificing intentionally questions at the end of every section at the expense of the, uh, at the benefit of the accuracy and actually getting the questions right that you're attempting. Anyway, Ben, you had an idea earlier. Yeah, the, the only idea I had was that maybe we could do this sticky note thing, right? I'm talking about a digital one. So you can actually turn off that icon, but you only get four chances. So it, it's going to tick down this way. It gives people the opportunity to feel what it's like without looking at a timer, but eventually you just can't do that anymore. Maybe even two times. I like that. That helped me but, out a lot. I'd be like, see, <laughs> or they can themselves implement the lo-fi solution. Yeah, well, see, we give them this opportunity and that also becomes the place where they learn about it because we can preach about it <laughs> yeah. in class all the time. But, you know, 80 yeah. percent of people are never going to get the message and they're they get a little pop up the fifth time they try to do it. And it's like, sorry, you're out of digital sticky notes. Yeah, you can go to may we know, recommend paper. may we recommend a paper sticky, mo sticky <laughs> note? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Good job learning the lesson that you really need to be ignoring this little graphic up here. 
Um, maybe somebody at law school admission council listens to this every once in a while and they like, we'll, we'll give them the tip that like, you'd, you'd be doing your students a favor. You'd be doing all applicants a favor if you let them actually turn off the clock. You're like, you're giving them an option to turn off the clock, but then you're still showing them a graphical version of the clock. What about an option to click it again and just have the clock go away? Gone. That, that would be a good development. Uh, tip. Please, Elsac. We would appreciate that. Yeah, that would be excellent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, let's shift into admissions, Micah. You're helping people with the LSAT, but you're also helping them get into school. Have you noticed any admissions trends lately, or surprises this cycle? Yeah, this cycle has been really interesting um, to watch. It's been very slow. I think that that's been sort of the feedback just all over the place um, with this cycle. And I, I think it's, you know, it's due to the, the end of affirmative action and, and things like that, um, that are making it so the schools are very much more cautious, I think, about who they're admitting and how they're admitting them. Um, so I'm seeing a lot more wait lists um, than I usually do, um, even with students that are applying, actually, especially with students that are applying earlier. Um, and I think that we're going to see a ton of wait list movement this summer um, relative to other years, like a lot of, especially, and this is mainly in the top 14, uh, I think other schools, um, outside of the top 14 have been more along the lines of what's been predictable, I think in the past. Um, but the T14 particularly has been very guarded, even when it comes to high stats applicants, because I think that they're still trying to find ways to round out their classes in diverse ways. Like they're not allowed to make decisions on the basis of race, but they still want to have a diverse class. You know, it does not look good for a law school when you walk into that class and there's no diversity. Like that's not a, not somewhere that, that is, you know, that's not a law school that's going to have a really sustainable reputation. And so I think that that's, that's contributing a lot to, um, sort of the slowness of this cycle. Now I have seen, um, a lot more, a, a lot less of that effect with clients that I have that have written diversity statements. Um, and I actually have some opinions on diversity statements that, that I think, I think are pretty common amongst those of us who are somewhat in tune with the law school admissions process, but like so many people are really hesitant to write diversity statements if they don't have something that is like on its face considered diversity, right? Like, like racial background or, um, um, sexual preference or, or something like that. Like those, those key areas that people will, like always write, like, this is what makes me diverse. But really what law schools are looking for in my experience is something that's giving you a diverse perspective at their law school, something that's going to make you approach things differently, round you out as an applicant and, and give you, you know, give you, a, give you something that is going to add to the conversation in the classroom. And I have seen just a, a weird amount of, disparity between the students who decide not to write those those diversity statements and the ones who do, even if those students don't have um, particularly like racial backgrounds that are generally considered diverse. And so I think what that is, is that the law schools don't have to sort of try to figure out what's going on. And and I, I mean, I'm just speculating here, but I have noticed that that's been really helpful. Um, in, in, in those, those students. Now that's a, a cycle's worth of information that, that isn't even over yet, but, um, just anecdotally speaking, that's been an interesting trend. So you're talking about like potentially straight white male, but comes from a poor background. Yeah. Um, or, or where you not even necessarily a poor background. Like I, I actually, so this is, this is a really personal anecdote, but I mean, looking back on it, I, I am that demographic, right? Like I am the straight white male who who grew up in a middle class family and doesn't have anything that that screams diversity. But when I got to Harvard, I was the only student that was admitted from Arizona. Period. There were like five students admitted from state schools. Like it's not common, and like they honestly, I think they should be admitting far more students across the T fourteen and across law schools in general. Um, who have those kinds of backgrounds. I think that the law schools want to as well. And given like Arizona has a very unique political climate, like we're a very purple state, recently purple, like it's normal to be friends with people across the aisle, like all these things that are like not necessarily common in 
generally very liberal institutions of law school. And like, if you're someone who, who comes from a background that is just unique in some way, like I wish that I had, had written a, a diversity statement about my best friend being completely polarly opposite from me politically, like that would have been a cool diversity statement. Like law schools are really struggling with this fed sock ACS thing. And, and, you know, like the political climate right now, and they don't want division in their campuses, at least in some, in, 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 in some senses. And so like that can make a good background. You know, uh, I had a client write a diversity statement. Actually, this was more of a personal statement, but it was still sort of spoke to this um, about directing a pageant in rural Florida. It was super unique and that, that, you know, such a, like a random thing to write your, your personal and, and also sort of diversity statement about but it really tells a lot about like how this, this student is going to think about everything here so differently. Like they're from rural Florida, like they're a pageant director, like what that's going to bring nothing but cool, unique stuff to our class. And that like, you want to stand out. You don't want to be one of the other, I don't know, what do they get? 11,000 at Harvard or something like that. Maybe more than that applicate applicants who are like, well, you know, here's my great GPA and great LSAT score. Like tell them who you are. Tell tell them what makes you different in your own opinion. If they don't think that you're different for that opinion, what are they going to do? I, I that's just I, it, it lets you round out your application too. I just think it's a it's a free extra essay that I mean, unless you are, I haven't met a client that that I couldn't like. You talk about how you, like everyone can write a personal statement about something that's really powerful. Like I haven't met someone who isn't unique in some way that they can say like, hey, this is who I am. So. We, we did a follow-up to a follow-up where somebody had been basically 177, 4.0, waitlisted at the entire top 14. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know much more about that applicant. And they were like, what do I do? Do I take the full ride to wash you in St. Louis? Or do I plan on reapplying next cycle? Or do I whatever? And we did talk a little bit about letters of continuing interest or continued interest, you kind of shook your head on that. What would you say about uh, letters of continued interest for that applicant? For that applicant, I would say reapply next cycle, period. How come? I mean, what did you say the LSAT was? 177, 4.0. 177, 4.0, right? Spend more time on your essays. Um, you know, like round out your, get some better letters of recommendation. Like that's a crazy LSAT score. And especially, I think, especially with, you know, the LSAT inflation that we've been seeing, GPAs are a little bit more important than they used to be too. Like you've got a 4.0 and a 177, please don't, like, please <laughs> reapply. Like, like I can guarantee you if you reapply with better essays and better materials and like really demonstrate to the law school that like, if you've got a top choice law school, don't be afraid to tell them that. Like maybe not in your initial application, but like, Sneak it in somewhere. They care. They really do, especially someone with stats like that. And if you can, if you can write solid essays and 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 yeah. and, and for your personal statement, like talk about you kicking ass at something, one thing that is that is an aspect of you know like who you are and your resume and things that you've done, but not like a like not like your major job. You know, like I mean, maybe you read about that, but like unless you've got something really unique to say about your major job, like find something that you've done that you've loved doing that you've kicked ass at. And write yeah. about that. That was our hypothesis as well. I think our advice is pretty sound. You know, like the best offer you're going to get is not a full ride to wash you. But you're going to get a better offer from some school in the top 14 with a 177 and an actual 4.0. We thought that yield protection might have something to do with it a little bit. But not now you're making me think. No, but it, it, like what I said yesterday was that or in last episode was that it could have been a combination of things, right? Harvard, Stanford, Yale tend to have a coin flip aspect to them where even if you're just totally baller, they might have somebody from your state already and they're like, yeah, no, nah, we we can't. Sorry. And so if you lose a few coin flips, which it's not that hard to lose three coin flips, right? So Harvard, Stanford, Yale, a bunch of coin flips. And then if some of the other schools are looking at you going, geez, 4.0, 177, why the hell would you come to UCLA? And they might be like, well, we need to protect our yield here and maybe we'll just waitlist you. We're not denying you, but we're waitlisting you, especially in this slow cycle. And we just want to see how serious you are about coming to the school. 
At which point that might be, you know, the point where if you write them a nice letter and say, hey, I'm, I'm still really interested in coming here. And now they've got a 177 and a 4.0 in their face again. And it's like, whoa, we should make an actual decision on this person. The, so the other reason that I'm hesitant about the LOCI thing is that weightless movement doesn't often result in great scholarships. Like right. at that point, they've got a, they've got a better hand than you do, right? At the right. end of the day, you've got to be asking yourself, do I have the better hand or do they, what are their incentives right. and what are mine, you know, and, and, and their incentives are always either both yield and yeah. financial, right? And at the end of the day, like if you don't have, if, if you're weightlisted everywhere else, you can't negotiate whatever pittance they give you because they're like, no, we're doing you a favor. We admitted you off yeah. our wait list. Although so the other thing too, oh yeah, go ahead. Well, counterpoint in a slower cycle and what, why the cycle, why this cycle is slow, we don't, we're not, we don't know for sure. We think that the Supreme Court decision has something to do with it. It seems as if the rules of the game have shifted, right? That, that decision matters to these people and the rules of the game have shifted. And what can happen in a new system, people don't know, like the schools, the individual players don't really know how it's going to play out. And they have their own version of loss aversion, which is that they don't want to make stupid decisions too fast that end up getting them fired, right? So they'd rather not act than just take a bunch of action that turns out later to be wrong. And so if they're just kind of, you know, in this cycle, if if all the schools are waitlisting heavily heavier than they normally do, then we could be in a situation where at some point somebody's going to have to start, you know, and, and we've seen this before with waitlists that when when one player starts doing something, then it's like the dominoes can all fall. And even though in the past waitlist admits have not resulted in scholarships, that could continue, but that can also change. They can do whatever they want. So it could be that this is the cycle where all of a sudden they start realizing that they're going to have to bid on people to get them off, to get them to come off the waitlist. Maybe that's very possible. Um, that, yeah, that's, that's definitely a possibility. I'm just like, I'm thinking about clients that I have with comparable stats that have uh -huh. applied this cycle. Like I, I don't have a client with both a 4.0 right now and something that high in the 170s. I have clients right. with 4.0s and in the 170s, but not, not 177 to 4.0. But yeah. my clients with, with like great stats have gotten in to T14s, all of them. And I, and a lot of them are getting, you know, wait lists in some places, but like it, they're like with, with full rides for a couple of them, like to T14 schools with worse stats. And so... Like there's that, but, but like, if it's all the T14, there's, there's two things. The other thing that's coming to mind is maybe there's something character and fitness there, which in, mm. if that's the case, then go back and reapply and do a better job explaining your character and fitness thing. Um, because that can definitely play a role depending on what that character and fitness thing is. Yeah. We never know what the applicant left out or the, the, podcast correspondent leaves out we don't we don't really know i'm although they do listen so hopefully they'll write us back in and and tell us uh, a little bit more about their case worst case though if they follow the advice that we gave in episode 446 it was basically like you know what you can write off this cycle reapply next cycle what's the worst that can happen from that micah would you ever think that that's like a terrible strategy Look, no, I think so assuming let's assume that this person is like a kjd going straight through and if they're not like this is even more true. I think but, like, assume that, okay, so assume yeah. that they are get a get a year of work experience. You're gonna know more about what you want to do anyway. You're gonna make some money, you're gonna be able to save. Like it, it doesn't even matter what you do. But like like if you're especially so think about it this way too. Like you're you're probably applying out of state. If you're applying to all the T14, you're planning on moving out of state. Spend time with your family, like say goodbye to people you not forever but you know like it's different to move across the country and to live far away from your loved ones like spend time with them work in a job that's going to benefit you like if you want to go to a law firm great if you don't and you want to try something else more power to you do that like you've got a year to enjoy life like i love to golf nathan i know that you love to golf too when i went back for my two years off I, I, oh did you has has that a has that hobby gone by the wayside no i mean i do play golf and i will continue to play golf for my whole life but i am not like a golf lover i'm not like up you know oh i gotta play my nine holes at 5 45 a.m before i do the rest of my day or anything <laughs> i'm like i go on trips with my buddies like four times a year and that's kind of like enough golf for me yeah so yeah like i mean it was 
I learned to golf during the COVID pandemic. I had a couple of friends in Arizona that I was, you know, right before I went to law school. Oh, you're summer, the one like golfing. With you're the buddies. one that made golf so popular. It's so crazy. As a golfer, COVID is the weirdest thing that ever happened to golf because golf was like real popular when Tiger Woods first came onto the scene, right? It's like all of a sudden golf is like really popular. But then over the years, it, it, fell in popularity and tiger stopped playing stopped playing well made a bunch of ruined his life did a bunch of really stupid things anyway so then golf became like what it kind of should be which is a very boring like white man sport old people you know it's like cbs sponsored by ibm and american express and it's just like this <laughs> it's for your grandpa right but but then covid and all of a sudden golf was the only thing that you could do and then micah and all his buddies started playing golf and that didn't go away. The popularity of like golf is more popular than I can ever remember it being in my entire life. And I just I'm always puzzled because I'm like, wow, this is so crazy. Like Five years ago, there was nobody out here. And now everybody's out playing golf. It's super fun. I played baseball through college. Um, and so for me, it's like it's like an extra way to keep swinging things like it's, it's awesome. But um, but yeah, like, I mean, I took that year. Or I took those two years. I got to I got to hang out with my friends and go golfing and, and really like my best friend in the world has become very much more my best friend because I got to spend an extra year with him without school hanging over my 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 head and things like that. Like, take a year. It's not going to oh, make totally. a difference. You're yeah. going to you're going to love it. Like, take the time off. Yeah. Sorry. I got golf. I guess I do love golf, kind of. I like talking about it anyway. <laughs> Hijack the conversation for 10 minutes. There's so many analogies to golf lately in the podcast that I was like, oh, well, Nathan likes golf. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's some feeling there, Nathan. There's something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. So, Micah, earlier we talked about you being in school and running Juris Prep. Any tips for anybody who's going to go to school and maybe want to work? What do you Wait tell till them? after one out. Wait okay. till after one L after, I mean, one L is insane. Uh, it's not, it's not as like crazy as, as you read in that book, one L by Scott Turo, like tons of people read that book. Like it, it's not the thing where it's like, look to your left, look to your right. One of those people is going to be gone when you're, it's not like that anymore. It is a lot of work. You have to take 16 credits, which is not like the undergraduate 16 credits, which is just a normal load. Like that's a big load in law school. That's a lot of reading, a lot of time. You've got a lot going on worry about working after, after you finish one L. The biggest reason that I'm able to do this is because I can pick every single one of my classes when it is, I can set up my schedule so that I have plenty of days and times to meet with clients and things like that. And it's working fine. I do think that some of that is contingent on the law school too. I do think Harvard gives a lot more flexibility in those aspects than some other law schools. I mean, I don't go to them, so I can't speak specifically, but um, I will also say though, like, I, I do recommend it. If you can manage it, like decrease your debt load because I mean, Harvard doesn't do full rides. Like I didn't, I didn't take the full ride offers that I had. I chose to go to Harvard and, and I'm going into some debt to do this and I'm trying to graduate as close to debt free as I can. And some of what I have to do to do that is work. And that's, that should be more normal for people to do. Um, it's something that I'm happy that I've done so far and I don't see myself stopping at all like it, it works out fine for me I, I don't feel overworked but i would have if it had been 1l when this started like i said I mean, like starting this company was kind of a lucky accident but i mean there are challenges with starting your own company obviously but at the same time you get the huge benefit of controlling exactly when and how you work and also controlling how much you get paid in a way you you know it can be more difficult when you're working an hourly job or something like that I mean, that's the route I would take, but I, I <laughs> any advice for someone who like, do you structure your day in a certain way? You mentioned that earlier a little bit, like you set aside time. Yeah. Biggest hack for law school, in my opinion, is to get your Mondays off. Everyone's trying to get their Fridays off. Like everyone wants Friday off, get Monday off. Grocery stores empty. Like you can travel. Like I fly back to Phoenix a lot. I schedule all my clients for the most part on, on Mondays and then throughout my classes throughout the rest of the week. So as long as I have that full day off on Mondays, I've got nine to five stack of clients. If I need to, it works out just fine. And then I'll meet with other clients that I can't fit into that um, here and there throughout the week, really all over the place throughout the week. But like, it, as long as you, as long as you're deliberate about your scheduling and, and, and meticulous about keeping track of your calendar, like if you, if you've got things slipping through the cracks, nothing's going to work. I used to be someone who was like, I'll remember to do that. 
And then I started this business. I was like, no, I can't do that anymore. Like really use your calendar, like, like plan things out when you make a commitment, put it into your calendar immediately. That's, that's, what's been the biggest thing for me, I think. Um, and then being able to pick when my classes are and, and when my other commitments are, has been really important too. When I was in law school, I remember that the students and, and, and this one in particular who always seemed to get straight A's and just kill it were the same students who I saw when, you know, I'd come into school and I don't know, my class started at nine or whatever. It was probably 857, right? And I'm like hurrying down the hallway to my class and I would always see the same student and students just sitting, reading. You know, like their their plan was to get up early, get the reading in. I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm showing up to class, and then I'm reading in the into the evening. I, I I don't think that was a good way of doing it. And how did you how did you how do you approach it? Well, I've I I mean I I've always been more of a night person. Um, so for at least the beginning, I was doing a lot of that, like staying up into the night reading. But when you're like, it's one thing to be a night person doing things that you like to do. <laughs> but I'm sorry. No one's, no one's loving. Well, maybe some people are, but not me. No one's loving their late night Civ pro reading, yeah, right? Like, yeah. You want to like, get that done. Or torts. It's just like, oh my goodness. So you're like late at, late at night, you're tired. It's a good way to fall asleep on your book. I did start actually to, to, you know, like, that's another thing too. If you, if you make your schedule right, you can give yourself time in the daytime when you're alert and fresh and you've had coffee and you're, you're a human being <laughs> and, and, you know, like setting things up for yourself so that you can do those readings in the morning. I do think that helps a lot. Um, I do think that helps a lot. Use public transportation to your advantage too. Like I live a little ways away from campus. I prefer it that way. A little bit less mixing of, uh, like personal life and school because I mean, law school, if you treat it like a full-time or a part-time job is a really good way to do it. And no one wants to live where they work. So like I, I'll use the public transportation as an opportunity to read too and like finish things up. Just like use your time wise, and I think is the biggest thing. Right. Nathan. You've been very generous with your time, Micah. I think we should probably pretty much wrap it up there. I did have one more question. Your website mentions uh, group classes, but you've really only talked about one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Um, so, so we've done group classes before, um, as a way to sort of build a client base. Um, something that I, uh, struggled with early on is, is like, I don't like sales and I don't want to sell people on me per se. And so what, but I, I mean, I will, if I know that I can really help somebody, but the problem that I was running into is with one-on-one -on -one coaching, it's more expensive. And a lot of students, especially initially, want to find the cheapest option with the best payoff. The problem is that most of the cheapest options don't have the best payoff, right? Like a lot of these programs are doing like, hey, it's free for you because you go to this school and it's this super unique thing. And like, they're going to pick that thing. And so I wanted to find a lower cost option for students so that they could realize really the benefit of coaching or, you know, like, or not even coaching, but like picking, you know, you get what you pay for and realizing that. And so what I did is I took, I mean, I, uh, you guys probably know this, but like when you're working with new clients or new students, you're mostly teaching the same stuff. Like you, you've got the same stuff to tell the same each person about um, logical reasoning, about reading comp and about games. Like I'm going to teach, I use the same game to teach worlds with sequencing games every time for a new client. Like I love this game. I think it's a great way to do it. It's super easy if you do worlds and it really like shows you like, Hey, this is how you should be thinking about these things. You know? And so what I did is I basically packed the each, you know, the way that I teach each section into 12 weeks of classes and then reached out to a ton of schools that I had partnerships with and said, Hey, like, if you want to do this, here's this super low price class. You can pay by the week. You can pay by the whole class. If you want to, like, I didn't, I, I didn't want to make a profit on it. I just wanted to show people like what Juris Prep can do and like how I teach and how much the payoff really is there. If you, you know, like if you, like, I like to use this example, like if you say you spend some preposterous, this is way too much money. Don't spend this much money ever, please. So you spend 15 grand on LSAT prep, on admissions, consulting, all these things, way too much money. Say you did and you save yourself $300,000 in the end because you get full rides and you go to somewhere with a full ride, or, you know, you change your life forever by getting into somewhere like Harvard that's worth it. I think for most people, like if you can manage it, that's worth it. 
Now, no one should spend that amount of money, uh, excuse me, spend that amount of money. And so what I was trying to sort of show people is get the, get the students who are hesitant to, to invest in something that they don't know what the payoff is going to be. Like other than reading testimonials on my website and other than hearing from people who have referred me, they don't know what they're getting, especially when me, a like a biased third party, or I'm sorry, biased second party is telling them like, Hey, you should pay for this. So I didn't want that to happen. And I wanted to have this lower cost option. And so I launched that last fall. It was very successful. It went really well. I recorded some of those classes there on my website now that you can purchase access to for a lot cheaper. Um, and I'm probably going to do it again next fall. I don't have the ability to keep them running all the time, but it's a way that I have for students who don't have a huge amount of capital that they want to spend to spend $300 for a 12 week class and get the basics. Like they're going to get everything that I would tell everyone else. They just don't get the one-on-one -on -one aspect where I'm like, okay, well, here's what you're doing. And for a lot of people, that's great because what they're doing is the same as what the next person is doing, like trying to finish the section or something like that. Like I can tell that to a group. I just can't give them the one-on-one, -on -one, like, hi, like we have rapport, like, trust me here, like I can help you out. So it's a trade-off. Um, but that, that was what that was for. Um, it's not over. It's not, it's not done. It's just like this semester, it's not going to work, especially with um, the way that Juris Prep is going right now. So cool. Uh, you want to hang out for word of the week and then we'll uh, wrap it up? Yeah, sure. Sounds good. We'll give you a quiz. Ready? Okay. Yeah, listener Carol asks us to describe the difference between the, the words prescribe and proscribe. Okay. So my describe am I am I giving the difference there? Yeah. Okay. So I mean so I think that the biggest the biggest thing on the L side is if you don't know what a word means, like do try to use context to figure it out. Um so I would be thinking about this in terms of when I know that that word works, right? Like if you're prescribed something, if a doctor prescribes you something, like it's a prescription, you're supposed to do it. Like this is something that you're, you know, supposed to do. Whereas proscribed is going to have a different meaning from that. Proscribed, let's see, like what would I think proscribed means? I actually struggle with this one. Um, we, scr we struggle on our word of the weeks all the time. No, no big deal. Yeah, problem. like a, a, a proscription is like, it's like the best practice for doing something or something like that. I'm not really, yeah. I don't know. I would, I would use context, I think, to figure that one out. Yeah, yeah this is interesting to. because uh, actually, so my thoughts on the definitions of these two words are different than I think what uh, Eric has included here. When I see prescribe and I see proscribe, prescribe to me sounds like you're describing what's happening and proscribing sounds like you're telling people what to do, but it sounds like it's the opposite. So well, prescribe. I like Mike as a doctor clearly prescribes you medication. That's the doctor telling you take this medication, writing a recommendation for you to take this medication. So a prescription or to prescribe something has to be to advise somebody to do a thing. Proscribe, it's going to turn out proscribe and i i have heard this word before but proscribe is it's like prohibit so it's no. actually it, yeah i i think that it's i think that proscribe actually has a negative connotation where prescribe has a positive connotation but we have a definition here from miriam webster and uh you want me to read it yeah proscribe and prescribe each have a latin derived prefix that means before attached to the verb scribe from scribere, meaning to write. So both pre and pro do mean before. You guys were both kind of poking around on that. Yet, says Merriam-Webster, the two words have very distinct, often nearly opposite meanings. Why? Well, in a way, you could say it's the law. In the 15th and 16th centuries, both words had legal implications. To proscribe was to publish the name of a person who had been condemned, outlawed, or banished. To prescribe means to lay down a rule, including legal rules or orders, which a doctor's prescription is a legal order. Um, right? It takes something from being illegal to being legal because of this doctor's prescription. But a proscription is, um, yeah, when you get uh, banned. So... So I, I think where I'm getting my definitions from is where uh, in the writing universe. So in the writing universe, I'm pretty sure prescribe is 
when you prescribe the rules of grammar, you're telling people what the rules are. And when you're prescribing them, you're telling them how you think they should be. So prescriptive, prescriptive is like, hey, this is what is happening, and you're less concerned about how it should be. Whereas like a grammar book would, tell, would prescribe the rules to you. It seems a little <laughs> different than what we're saying here, but I'm pretty sure lay down a rule is just actually describing what that rule is. In that, that's how they use it in those contexts, I'm pretty sure. In those contexts, yeah, I've never heard them in those contexts at all. I think in much more common context, I, I think, you know, that might be a definition of those words, but I don't think that's the first definition of those words. You've got special training in, you know, legal writing and you've studied uh, like a special version of language, but prescribe. Yeah, let's see. To lay down a rule or to dictate to write or give medical prescriptions. Whoa, to become by prescription invalid or unenforceable. Weird. So these are words that have like come to mean different things over time. That's clearly you're seeing like the evolution of the, of the language. Yeah. Yeah. For the LSAT, I wouldn't ever worry about that third definition. For the most part, I don't think I've ever seen a word that had like multiple layers of definitions where it was like one of the lower ones. So hopefully, hopefully it's not that one on the LSAT. Huh. OK, cool. Um, thanks, Micah, for coming on the show. Uh, got yeah, Micah, again, is a uh, Harvard now 2L and founder of Juris Prep. That's JurisPrep.com, right, Micah? Dot org. Uh, jur jurisprep.org. Interesting. Okay. And you can, yeah. you can reach out to us with any questions or, or any interest um, at contact at jurisprep.org. Um, and we are also currently enrolling for the class of, I guess, uh, this upcoming application cycle starting in September for admissions consulting. So if you go to our admissions consulting page um, and you're interested in that, just go ahead and fill out that form and, um, and we'll, we'll get back to you. How late is too late to apply? Uh, I was wondering if you'd ask me that question. Um, T14 a while ago, if you're looking at a regional state school um, that isn't ranked, you know, above 50, I don't, I mean, it depends on their application deadline. Like a lot, like, like a good example, um, I've had a, like a weird amount of success in Florida. Florida schools take applications until like July, even University of Florida, um, which is ranked at 20, um, maybe 22 now in the new rankings, but it doesn't matter. It's still ranked 20. Um They'll take applications really late. And I've had clients get full rides to University of Florida applying in like May and June. So it really depends on the, the, the area. But for the most part, like apply sooner, like apply in September all the time if you can. And if not, like I, like I won't take clients except on like that kind of case by case basis. Like if you're applying to your region, like sure, maybe we can talk about it. But like I won't take a client that's trying to apply to T14s after, honestly, after like November. I think that at that point, it's it's they it may as well just wait the cycle, maybe December. It would again, it would depend, but really, really apply in September, apply in September, October, the latest, if you can pull it off. Can't hurt you right? to apply earlier in the cycle. One thing that Ben and I always say is like, well, you might be able to get away with it later in the cycle. But if we were controlling the purse strings, right, if it was us making this financial decision and if it were us entering into these negotiations, which every application is a negotiation. Um, you know, you're like showing up on the car dealer lot. When you walk onto the lot, that's in your, the negotiation has started. And so like, how does it hurt you to just wait until September? You know, you're trying to apply right now in March or whatever. Come on, wait six months and put yourself in such a better position to start the negotiation. Well, and um, if you're applying now, you're rushed, like spend the time on the applications, put together something really good. Put your best LSAT, better materials, better everything. All right. Ben, you want to wrap it up there? Yeah, certainly. Be LSAT famous. Please ask questions or share news with us on our website, thinkinglsat.com, or on our socials. That's LSAT Demon. If you have questions about the LSAT Demon, you can always email us at help at lsatdemon.com. Check out our other podcast, LSAT Demon Daily. Thanks again, Micah, for coming on. That was episode 448 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. Thanks all y'all for listening. Nice knowing you. Don't pay for losses.